this week as we travel through the year masonically sometimes things become a little laid back things become not exciting and then one day our thumbs stop scrolling we see something inspiring and that's just what brother randy sanders has in store for us as he talks about inspiring events happening in freemasonry and what that could mean for all of us then we'll hear from brother matt gallagher in his exclusive practical freemasonry segment why should you be a mason and perhaps why you shouldn't we'll wrap it up with a new piece from the midnight freemasons brother jp brings up a very important topic what happens when we let basic beliefs become politicized and what effect does that have on freemasonry all this and more stay tuned Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 515. Right away, let's go ahead and thank our contributors, our fellows, our producers, and legacy partners who help bring this show to you every single week. Since 2011, over 10 years ago, we've been bringing this podcast to everybody out there who is interested in Freemasonry and its quote-unquote kindred sciences, as Albert Mackey would say. This show is not possible without that help, and if you are interested in how you can assist bringing Masonic education to anybody interested in this endeavor, then head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can help. We've also got links in a shop where we sell various items that you know I package up right here in my own home office and send to you, and a bookstore with links that are through Amazon affiliates. All of that money goes right back into the production of this program, making it all possible. Now, coming up to the news in just a few days from the time I'm recording this, so uh, if you're listening to this on Sunday or Monday, it'll either be the next day or the today. <laughs> I'm going to be doing an Oktoberfest festive board at Austin Lodge number 12. I'll be doing the talk on Adam's Grave, the legend of Adam's Grave. Uh, it's a really fun talk. I think you guys who are going to be present will really enjoy it. We'll explore literal interpretations of Adam from Genesis, his relation to Freemasonry, and we'll have an exploration of just where his body could be found today. It's a fun and interesting presentation. And then right after that, I come home, and I'm only home for two days before heading down to Springfield, Illinois, Springfield, Illinois, to go to the Grand Lodge Sessions. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing a lot of my brothers there and celebrating our craft with great brothers, great fellowship, and continuing our mission as a grand body in making the world better. So hopefully I will have a chance to see you all at Grand Lodge, Illinois, or in Austin, Texas. Now, speaking of Grand Lodge sessions, let's get into our first piece this week, and it's called Gaining Perspective, and it's by Brother Randy Sanders off the Midnight Freemasons blog. Let's check out what he has to say. Gaining Perspective. As I'm preparing to leave for the 2021 Missouri Grand Lodge communication, I feel anxious, blessed, and reflective. I feel anxious as the COVID pandemic took so much from us and in reality continues to do so. I feel blessed as I get to gather in the mystic ties of brotherhood with so many good Masons over the next few days. I feel reflective in that what came before me built the perspective from which I see today. As we embark on today's journey to the Grand Lodge communication, I joyously followed Brother Matt Parker's postings from the North Carolina Grand Lodge communication and Brother Muhammad Yatim's and others' postings of a new AMD council in Chicago. The excitement expressed through these brothers is reporting their activity becomes, dare I say, contagious. I was ready to leave early for Grand Lodge hitting the road yesterday, even though I knew the big festivities begin today. Brother Cameron Adamson flew into St. Louis yesterday, and as I picked him up from the airport, that feeling of excitement over gathering to meet continued to remind me of the many blessings we Masons enjoy through our work. Brother Cameron's sheer joy at traveling to another jurisdiction to share in the fraternal aspects, meet and greet brothers from another country, discuss all things Masonic with new and old acquaintances, again contagious. 
Brothers Joshua Herbig and Parth Patel are making their morning preparations and plans, including meeting up with them to speak to a new candidate and drop off a petition. A new petition? On the way to Grand Lodge? Absolutely electric. As Brother Masons spread out all over the globe, we aren't alone in doing charity, but we are blessed in being together to do charitable work. We aren't the only organization founded in brotherhood, but we are blessed to have such a rich and solid tapestry of history to which we can proudly point. We focus on the daily work, the next project, the lodge repair, or the next piece of equipment we need to purchase. Yet, at the end of the day, we made a difference. We reflect upon our work yesterday and beyond, and we see the future by building our trussel board, taking our past into account. In the Robin Williams movie, Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams's character reminds us to carpe diem or seize the day. He goes on to push his students to make their lives extraordinary. Another quote from the movie is, just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Spoiler, if you haven't seen it, this is where he memorably stands on his desk, explaining it's all about gaining perspective. We as Masons are given different perspectives. We learn through the degrees to look at so many different things and ideas via these different perspectives. Every working tool, every symbol, lecture, and charge reinforces the means to gain a new perspective. Are you seizing the day? Are you gaining perspective? How are you going to use that new perspective to be a better Mason today? Brother Randy Sanders. Wonderful piece, Brother Randy. I have to say that's something that I'm often thinking about in my career as a Mason has always been perspective. When I'm talking about Freemasonry, I'm often mentioning the ideas of perspective, and people seem to not understand what is maybe meant by it. Maybe it's just lip service or words that fill the void in the space in between talking about the weather. And this bothers me because when I speak about getting perspective, it means that I'm actively listening to my brother to get his point of view and then before I dismiss it or think that my brother is just crazy for holding such a view, regardless of what it is, perhaps I'm asking them questions about why they think this way and what has brought them to that thinking. So their life experiences, which has brought them to that thinking. And that is me gaining their perspective. And then I can come to them from a point of of similar attitude. I can put myself in their shoes. You remember when our parents used to say, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes? That's hard to do, but the reward is worth it. You're closer to your brothers, and perhaps you've now swayed yourself to their thinking, or you may have realized a folly in their thinking and may offer as a brother a way to aid them in their reformation. So perspective is key. It's also key because of the organization that we are a part of, we gather together on the level and we are many faiths under one roof. So to understand our perspectives of our brethren is a sign of respect and being on the level with them also. So perspective, it's not everything, but you know, it's a pretty big chunk. And maybe it is a great foundation for Freemasonry. Gaining perspective on our members allows us to be on the level. Now, of course, we can just say, yep, we're all on the level and then not care about our brothers and their beliefs and never ask them about it and just assume it's all okay. But that's not really brotherhood, is it? Shouldn't we know each other and care? My question for our Craftsman Plus out there is, tell me about a time your perspective has changed after listening to another brother's perspective. Now, as we continue a series of segments from Brother Matt Gallagher on Practical Freemasonry. Let's check it out. Why You Should Be a Mason and Why You Should Not Be a Mason. An excerpt from the book Welcome to the Brickyard by me, Matt Gallagher. I decided for once to leave Lodge at a reasonable hour. After a quick stop at the store, I'd be spending the rest of the night with my wife. Mind you, at my lodge, a reasonable hour is 10.30 p.m. on a Thursday. But regardless, handshakes were exchanged and away I went. 
I got eight blocks. My van was sluggish and veering the starboard, and despite all my hopes and dreams, I know what that means, so I pulled over and I did a walk around. A flat. Terrific. Now, I'm a capable adult, mostly. Had this been the 90s, I could have fixed the flat myself, when donut tires were easily accessible from the trunk, and I could still bend and flex. Sadly, these are an anachronism today. My impossibly German-engineered spare was impossibly German-engineered under the carriage of my car, and accessible only with a special toolkit that, along with the owner's manual, was suspiciously missing when I bought the van from the used car dealership. My expired AAA card stared at me smugly from the cup holder, where I discarded it after a wallet culling. I could re-up my membership for a mere hundred bucks, and maybe they'd get me rolling again. Or maybe, like before, they'd tow me to a garage which, for a couple hundred more bucks, would look at my car the next day, and maybe I could hitch a ride home with a friend, and call in sick the next day, etc. Instead, I put out the bat signal on the group chat. After all, Lodge was just eight blocks behind me. We'll be right there, was the immediate reply. Before I finished my cigarette, a truck pulled up and three brothers stepped out. The worshipful master, a medical student, and a next cop with a lumberjack beard. We make a trip to Walmart, where one of the brothers buys a jack and a monkey wrench. He needed them too. He's a prepper, so it was comforting to know that I wasn't alone in my unpreparedness. We spend a while looking up loosely related videos and a lot of trial and error trying to get the spare from the car. There was also a considerable time spent laying in the gutter by the ex-cop because, let's face it, he was the one with the beard. Luckily, we avoided doing any permanent modifications to the car, and after two hours of cold, mud, grease, and bad language, I was on my way home. It being only 1 a.m., my brothers were on their way back to the lodge. Did they do it because they're masons? No. They're masons because they do it. Seriously, though, why be a mason? There are a lot of reasons why Freemasonry remains one of the finest, most fulfilling fraternal organizations for men, young and old. But I'm not going to go into them. They're not secrets or anything, I just can't think of a better reason to join than the story about my flat tire. I needed friends, I had them. No question. No spiel about ritual or self-discipline or self-improvement can hold a candle to having a crew. And if you've already got one, great. You honestly may not need Freemasonry. It is so much more than a brotherhood, but without those things, the regalia, lectures, and lodge rooms, and even most of the ritual, it would still be Freemasonry. But without Brotherhood, Freemasonry would be nothing. As I said, they didn't do it because they're Masons, they're Masons because they do it. By that I mean that helping their fellow man is in their nature. It's how they were raised, it's how our species evolved. But it's something many of us have a hard time exercising, because goodness is a muscle that needs building, or it atrophies. Masonic Lodge is like a gym, and Freemasonry is the workout routine for building a strong sense of goodness. There are other ways to get exercise in our society, but they all come around to the same basic concepts and conduct. If you're trying to be a good person, and you're trying to do the right thing, and you're trying to make yourself a better man, then you're already a Mason in a sense. This is sometimes a concept that pisses Masons off, and I get it. I'm a writer, I went to school for writing, I've spent decades honing the craft of writing, you scribbling down some angsty poetry in high school technically makes you a writer. But be real, this is my job. And in that sense, a Freemason meets certain standards, takes certain obligations, and these are what makes him a Freemason. But in the metaphoric sense, we call ourselves Masons because, like Michelangelo says, the masterpiece already exists within the stone. An artist's job is to merely chip away the unneeded pieces. We liken this work to creating the stone blocks of a building, because rather than see ourselves as unique snowflakes of museum-quality art that only exist to be looked at and adored, we'd rather think of ourselves as being a useful part of the greater design. If you are already doing this work, and you think of yourself in this way, then you pretty much already are a Mason. And if you're a woman, or an atheist, or something else our particular organization denies entry to, then you're still a Mason. Because as one of my Masonic mentors said to me, it's not to be one as one, it's to be one be one. You should be a Mason because you should improve yourself, and you should improve the world. And the truth is, there are plenty of Masons out there who aren't Freemasons. And sadly, there are no shortage of Freemasons who aren't Masons. Because they just don't do the work. Or care more about being good than being seen as good. So the question is, why should you be a Freemason? Why should you join this little club where we charge dues and give you funny passwords and handshakes and ask you to man the griddle at pancake breakfasts? 
it's because you probably suck at being good and improving yourself. Or if you don't suck, you're at least probably not meeting your potential. You can read self-help books and join clubs and go to church, and you really should do all of these things, but Freemasonry might be the only organization whose particular intention is to do all these things, rather than have them happen as side effects. It does have some crossover with a church or other house of worship, but while they're focused on saving your immortal soul, Freemasonry is more focused on keeping you from being a huge schmuck here on Earth. My brothers helped me with my flat tire because they're obligated to do so, but also because they're the type of guys who like to help people, and I was the type of guy worth helping. These are the three things Freemasonry tries to grow, and that's why I'm a Freemason. Why you shouldn't be a Freemason. Freemasonry is shrouded in a pop culture mystique of danger and intrigue. Now, I won't comment on if any of those intrigues are true, hint, they are, but one thing is for sure, Freemasonry has gotten a reputation as an organization in decline. This is not true. Freemasonry is growing almost everywhere in exciting ways. Lodges are bringing in young, vibrant members, eager to learn traditions and add their own modern perspective. What is true, however, is that Freemasonry, along with every other fraternal club, saw huge booms in the early and mid-20th century, and those boom times are gone. Frankly, those boom times were probably not that great for Freemasonry. They drew focus away from self-improvement and brotherhood, and more into publicly focused areas. Rather than helping each other grow better, many used their brotherhood to help each other grow richer. Charity became an industry when it's supposed to be a personal offer of relief from the giver, and an acceptance of responsibility from the receiver. When membership declined from these lofty heights, some Masonic lodges moved toward an any and all comers view of membership. But Freemasonry is not for everyone. Sadly, it's not even for most people. And joining a Masonic lodge thoughtlessly isn't good for you or your lodge. Here are the reasons why you shouldn't join Freemasonry. One, you're looking for business contacts. I can't say you won't find them in a lodge, you can help meeting potential business contacts when you meet new people, but frankly, you're probably not going to have much luck. Masons come from every walk of life. Going to a lodge for networking is like going to a baseball park for networking. No one is there to see you pitch. The person you're talking to is as likely to be out of work as he is to be able to do anything for your business interests, and frankly, you're a giant distraction. There are networking benefits. If you meet a brother who is a mechanic, then you've got a pretty good chance he'll give you a square deal and treat you right. Not because you're both Masons, but because he's probably just a good guy. If you're looking for help expanding your client base, however, look elsewhere. Who you should join. The Rotary Club. Rotary International is a worldwide service club for both men and women, dedicated to bringing together businessmen and professionals conducting business in an ethical manner, and coming together to serve their communities and provide humanitarian efforts. Their motto, Service Above Self. Two you're looking for a place to serve pancakes. Masonry has been called the world's greatest charity, and though we do affiliate ourselves with several charitable groups and believe that relief is a core tenet of being a better man, Freemasonry isn't a service club. It's a brotherhood. Community service, raising money for your town, youth groups, or park amenities, is a noble thing, and there are plenty of Masonic lodges that do this. In some of these cases, the pancake breakfasts, spaghetti dinners, corn roasts, etc., are more to keep a lodge's doors open than for the community at large, but most are to raise money for Masonic youth clubs and educational scholarships. But in all honesty, if your focus is on community service, there are just clubs that just plain do it better than we ever will. Who you should join? The Lions Club. Lions Club International does community service probably better than anyone in the world. I frequently see them in my town, getting involved and getting their hands dirty. They are also very active in charity work. Their motto, we serve. Three, you're looking for a social club. A great Masonic Lodge will have great fellowship. And that fellowship is part of the package of dedication, ritual, education, and self-discipline. Freemasons aren't friends, we're brothers, members just looking for pals and drinking buddies without being willing to give that extra part of themselves will ultimately find Freemasonry a lonely, unfulfilling pursuit. You get what you give in any group, but that is especially true in Freemasonry. Who you should join, the Elks Lodge. The benevolent and protective order of Elks began in much the same way as the Shriners, an excuse to drink. The organization has since expanded from these modest goals into a larger service organization, doing charity and community work. 
but still greatly remain a social fraternity. They are open to men and women, and include some light ritual and regalia, originally borrowed from the Freemasons, but which have since been adapted to their own purposes. Much like Freemasonry, they are enjoying a youthful resurgence in places across the country, by young men and women looking for fraternity and people of good character with which to befriend. 4. You believe Freemasons are a secret cabal here to bring about a new world order. Yeah, we did that already. It's called Western Democracy. The representative republic you're enjoying if you live anywhere in North America or Europe is what we were working towards. We weren't the only ones, but we looked the best doing it. You're welcome, Earth. Who you should join? Alex Jones. Honestly, I don't even think Alex Jones cares about the Freemasons anymore. The Illuminati, the Deep State, Bilderberg, Bohemian Grove, Skull and Bones, hallucinogenic mechanical elves powered by blood and death sacrifice, etc. These are all much sexier and more interesting than the Freemasons. We just lost our luster, I guess. Adults don't often have a lot of time on their hands, and we're all looking for different things in life. I've interviewed plenty of petitioners who try convincing me what a wonderful mason they'll make, but when they get that great honor, they discover they should have done more listening than talking, and that Freemasonry is not for everyone. Don't settle for it. If you're exploring the craft and you're turned off by aspects of it, don't limit yourself to Freemasonry. There are many opportunities for you. But if you find yourself interested in not just friendship, but brotherhood, if you believe you need to improve yourself rather than just your community, if you believe that charity begins with a hand up and not a hand out, then absolutely knock on our doors. We'll be there to answer. I'm Matt Gallagher for the Whence Came You podcast. All right, to Brother Matt Gallagher, this was a great segment. I think my favorite part was not just saying why you shouldn't join Freemasonry, but also offering in a way, a comparison of values with those other organizations that do exist that might meet those specific needs people are looking for when they probably shouldn't be joining Freemasonry, taking a look at the Lions or the Elk or some of those other fraternities. Stay tuned for next week. We'll have another cool segment coming up from Brother Matt Gallagher and his work in practical Freemasonry. Now, you can check out links back to his website. will be in the show notes. I highly encourage all of you to check it out. Before we move into the next piece, I did want to mention, I hope you guys are all enjoying the found symbol, the episode-by-episode episode breakdown with tons of spoilers. It's all spoiler uh, for the lost symbol that's premiering on Peacock. They're on episode three at the time of recording this. Uh, we just went live with the uh, third it episode for the found symbol last Thursday. So if you haven't watched the show, don't watch the podcast or listen to it. Again, it will spoil everything for you. So make sure you watch the uh, actual show, then check out our show. And for some amazing extra stuff with people who have been actually working with Peacock Network, the House of the Temple is doing their show also, which is equally fascinating and fantastic. Brother Maynard does a great job with that. And I would just encourage you all to check that out also. More content, and it's a lot of fun. All right, next up, I wanted to read a new piece that uh, just came out on the Midnight Freemasons as well. But I really felt, now I, I know some of you may have read these already, but I just really enjoyed this piece here from Brother Ken. This one is called, In Which All Men Agree. And it really goes along with this idea of perspective. Let's have a read in which all men agree. I had a lot of questions before I was willing to petition a lodge. For me, it was never about wearing my grandfather's ring or a specific charity project. I wanted to know how my association with the craft would affect my moral reputation and more importantly, how it would impact my conscience. The selling point for me was that I could be around people who were diverse in belief, but shared my values. Think about that. As an interfaith minister and citizen of the world, I appreciate, rather than just tolerate, other beliefs. As someone educated in the humanities, I expect that there is more than one way of looking at things, be it economics, or politics, or human nature. But I expect certain truths to be universally understood, even if the application of them may take forms that may pit us against one another. 
Masonry teaches us to love one another in spite of our spirited debates and disparate votes. The more I become aware of Masonic experiences across my jurisdiction and the world, the more I see a diversity of expressions of Masonic principles. However, I am also seeing a diversity of values, some of which are incompatible with what I would suggest are taught in our lessons. Contemplating the inconsistent amity regarding Prince Hall Masons, for example, exposes two centuries of fundamental duplicity. By continued support or silent complicity of segmented recognition, we clearly do not practice what we preach. But it's more than institutionally systemic. It's personal. In the last year, it has become painfully obvious that political divisions have crept into the craft. Or that's what we think is happening. I suggest it's much, much worse. Basic values, rather than just specific beliefs, have become politicized. I'll read that again. Basic values, rather than specific beliefs, have become politicized. It is not that we are bringing politics into the craft, but that people are bringing politics into the very discussion of our values. Partisan lines have been drawn, even if only in stereotype, as to which human beings are worthy of our help and which deserve our fear. Justice has become a charged buzzword, liberty a hollow platitude, equality a battleground. These words have taken on political meanings that have nothing to do with the morality on which all responsible, good, and decent people can agree. There was even one brother on Facebook who expressed how angered he became upon seeing a Be Kind bumper sticker. How bad have things gotten to where we use terms like virtue signaling to dismiss or even ridicule today's version of love thy neighbor? People don't like being told that what they are doing or not doing is inconsiderate or selfish. We may be reminded of our obligations by some stranger, and it infuriates us. Mind you, such things may be worth civilly debating, if there is an ethical rebuttal to be had, but such conversations are almost immediately framed by the actions or opinions of politicians who, frankly, were not invited to the conversation. We may be wrestling over things like political correctness and identity politics, but the underlying values they deal with, however poorly or disingenuously, should not be held in question. Many of us use a dislike of certain people demanding civic duty and respect as an excuse to not be a good person. Instead, we defiantly base our patriotism on personal sovereignty without obligations. We put party identities over the country we claim to love. With so much ritual touching upon the subject of good citizenship, we must wonder if brothers with this attitude have taken the same degrees as the rest of us. But don't get me wrong. Masons aren't perfect. So what makes us Masons? It's not that we aren't ever prejudiced or selfish, but that we try not to be. It's not that we don't sometimes ignore the needs of our fellow man or lack tolerance toward them, but that we aspire to do so as we are able. Seeking to be better ought to be considered an unwritten, yet non-negotiable, landmark of masonry. If we can at least agree on that, how many of us live up to it? Brother Franklin had his detailed plan to focus on a different virtue each week, yet after years of rotations had not become a perfect ashlar. But he made an honest, conscious effort to live a truly virtuous life nonetheless. How many workmen actually do this most important of Masonic work in some way, big or small? And if we are failing to do even this, do we accept whispered wise counsel and be awakened from our moral slumber? I would never ask more of a fellow brother. But there are those who are petulantly stubborn in their righteousness or simply do not care. Those latter stones may not ever be of suitable material, and yet some lodge did a disservice to us by admitting them to our quarries. At least from my experience, we are getting better at guarding the West Gate. Gone are the days when petitions were handed out like brochures to a carnival. But we still find ourselves with a necessary purging of our lodges. By that, I don't mean merely to forbid prejudices, 
incivilities, or other unmasonic conduct when and where we find it. I mean the lodge within ourselves. What Masonic values have we rebelled against in the name of politics? Can we find a way to live up to our obligations without becoming untrue to our particular beliefs, political or otherwise? And if one has to go, a political belief or a principled value, we must decide which to divest ourselves of. Such choices will prove our true worth as good men and masons. JP. I loved this piece. Why? Because it speaks to the issue at hand. It speaks to something that's been on my mind forever, which is the kind of people that we have led into our institution. And this has been something we've talked about for a long time. But I think the over politicizing of every single base value, not the belief, but the actual value, you've politicized a value that people have. With that comes danger because values aren't political. Values are just values. And with these things that have been going on in our country and in the world, we have seen sides to our own brothers that have reared their heads in ways that essentially out them as people who stand for principles and live within perspectives that are in fact unmasonic. And the danger here is not just to a tarnishing of our reputation from within and knowing that you might be sitting next to somebody like that. The danger is even greater. It's that the Mason of tomorrow, the equitable minded potential person coming into the craft can find out about this and be turned off. Doesn't want to associate with a group who might have these kind of folks in it that are known and that nothing is done about it. In addition, when the media gets a hold of a story, potentially, on something that has happened and relates it back to Freemasonry or that we harbor such beliefs within the craft, that is dangerous. That is not a good look for the world's oldest and best fraternity. My question for our Craftsman Plus here is nothing specific. I just would love to hear your thoughts, large or small, on Brother Ken's piece. Feel free to leave them in the comments. Feel free to head on over to the blog and leave them there, whatever you'd like. If they're more intimate and you'd like just, you know, us, the your fellow online journalists to read those, that's fine too. And you all know my thoughts, I just said them, uh, but I'll be more than happy to type those up and leave them there also. But most of my thoughts on this kind of thing really are echoed in another side project that I run called The Civic Freemason. And you can check that out at civicfreemason.com and there's also a link to it on the WCY podcast website. That's it for this week. My thanks goes out to all our contributors, fellows, producers, legacy partners, and of course, the great work by Matt Gallagher. Check out his works by going to the link right there in the show notes. And hopefully I'll see you in Austin or at Grand Lodge Sessions. Until next week, stay on the level for Whence Came You from Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 